Okay, welcome back to VMworld 2013. This is a special presentation of theCUBE, a special exclusive coverage of the NetApp customer party. We are live at AT&T Park, out on the outfield grass with the anchor desk. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and Jim Sangster. Solutions marketing, cloud, 100% of the time, right here. We're going to talk cloud, on the, the outfield grass at AT&T Park. Absolutely, Jim. it's getting cold, there's mist all over the table, it's kind of cloudy, right? There yeah. you go. <laughs> Happy customers, for the folks who can't see around us, you got everyone just having an on the field hangout. The, we had the VMworld executives here, great event. And guys, they're all here for the cloud gym, so the cloud is the story. All the disruption that was supposed to happen is happening right now. You're seeing virtualization go to get it mature fast, Software-defined data center now coming into, into sight. Software-defined networking in play. Software-defined storage. It's all this, falling into place. It's all falling into place. Give us the next, what's the next act? Well, I, you know, some of it's actually where we've been. So I want to go back a little bit and then go forward. So it, our really beginning in this was quite a long time ago in the technology. We had a lot of our big customers. They were actually service providers before it was called cloud. We started building in multi-tenancy, all sorts of features like that, it lent well into these environments that also went right into virtualization as we started looking at that. Then we very intentionally put a strategy together and that strategy was for our partners and our sales teams to actually be able to say, we can sell you a private cloud, we can also sell you a public cloud. We did not want to have them say, on-premises is good, off-premises is bad. So we put together a program and that has really worked out well to the day we now have over 300 offerings in that program that we can co-market and co-sell with our service providers. So we're actually being able to have not only a whole portfolio of private cloud offerings, but that 300 different offerings to choose from. Yeah, Jim, you brought that up about the service providers having you know the cloud-like requirements, and you know us old school guys and other people here. Oh yeah, cloud was always cloud, was always the data center. But what really makes it a new category is the implementation and the disruptive changes in innovation. Changes to the, the use of use, the benefits to business. So just talk about that for a minute because, and, 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 and go back to the, to the old school where, hey, a data center was a network. Right. They had security issues, there's always data protection issues, there's always privacy, and just, but with the cloud just makes it a little bit different. It makes it different, you have to, th and what we're thinking about are the customers, instead of having to really own and operate everything on premise in their data center, they still have to own the data, they still have to own what we call the stewardship of that data, but now that's extending out, that's going over many different service providers potentially. They've got multiple software as a service, they need to tie that together. They might have infrastructure of a service from somebody else. They've got their own private cloud. They want to pull that all together. Yet they want to be able to still have their stewardship of that data as they do so. So what we've been working toward is being able to use cluster data on tap as that fabric that ties it all together. So your data becomes very fundamentally important in the context of how you have these clouds interoperate together. So a lot of people think about the, the orchestration, the management, that's super important. And that's been a lot of what's been talked about here this week. The networking comes in, so software-defined networking. But data itself, not just storage, but data itself is really important. So I got to ask you, Dave and I were at VM World, uh, EMC World 2010 when theCUBE actually started its life, its journey. Who knew it would turn out to be on the outfield uh, grass of AT&T Park? But that was when EMC launched the journey to the private cloud. I don't know if you remember the day, that yeah, day. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, the journey. Private cloud was the promised land. But what happened was, well, we, well, some will argue this, private cloud just never materialized. And what people wanted was hybrid, right? So public cloud's already out there. We know what Amazon does, Rackspace, right. a variety of other solutions out there, niche solutions, more mainstream, whatever. Public's pretty clear. Infrastructure service, PaaS, and SaaS. Data centers, extension to private is basically hybrid. Do you agree, and is that the, the, the safety ground that people are building out on today? I think you know that's really exactly where we see it. We see it not only as a what we call a simplistic hybrid, which is just a, a one, one public to your one private, but really that composite hybrid of tying multiple flavors together. And that's really where we see it coming together. Private cloud is harder than it seems. It, it sounds very easy. Some people kind of thought of it as just it a, sounds bunch, safe. a bunch of virtualization and that's my cloud. It, it's more than that because as you mentioned, it's changing your operations, 
it's changing how you get toward a, a service catalog of IT services, and then the self-service on top of it, if you're really taking yeah. it that far. And all the processes. This means integration issue. Automation, it's right. not trivial. You know, you're talking about 300 solutions before. Um, that's a lot, that's more than I realized that you guys had. Give me some examples of some of the, sort so of the bigger some, ones. When we look at the, the public cloud offerings that we have, it ranges from some of the big, huge names. So, key systems globally providing SAP as a service to some massive customers. So that's, that's one na name brand, right? Rackspace offers some other services. Then it goes down, and we found that we had to go deeper, particularly in Europe, to a lot of regional actual providers, and then people, because they have the regulations, regulations, I'm sorry, that the data actually has to stay in country. So we couldn't just go with these big pan-European, we had to really get down in some of the smaller European countries to have multiple offerings. It might just be an offering in northern Italy, for example. They don't even get all the way to the south. And then that would mean that we have to get into southern Italy and work our way up as well. So that if we look at that portfolio of 300, there's quite a few big, huge names that you'd all recognize. And then there's also some more smaller boutique offerings. And then some other examples. We had some last night at an analyst dinner we had right around the corner. And we had VirtuStream. VirtuStream is also a provider of big business applications. So Oracle, SAP, but they're more boutique than say a, a T-Systems. And they do some really interesting offerings with their own orchestration that they put together. Yeah, and we had, we've had we had Simon on. In fact, Simon Aspinall was here uh, last year. Oh, great. And we okay. interviewed him. And uh, he was saying last night that Virtually all their deployments now have some degree of hybridization to them, to John's earlier point, um, which, and then we, we were talking a lot about the discussion on, you guys call it data governance and, and the like. Uh, we've been talking here about the whole NSA thing and PRISM, that came up last night as well. Has the, the conversation escalated in the last several months as a result of some of the privacy concerns, which a lot of people sort of poo-pooed or focused on security and not really so much on the privacy. Has that really started to escalate in your world? We've seen it escalate, and I think the, the turning point for us was really back in November when we announced the NetApp private storage for AWS. And what that allows us to do is actually have a customer with their private cloud put their data close to EC2. So it's the same as being able to take advantage of that elastic compute, but they maintain control of their data. It's as if their data is in the cloud, but it's not. It's actually next to the cloud at a co-location facility like Equinix. And by doing that, that allows those large customers to get over some of those hurdles where that they couldn't go to the cloud because of those privacy concerns or some of the regulations in their industry. Yeah, I mean, you guys have embraced the uh, the AWS mojo. Absolutely. We're going to be at reInvent this year. We're yeah. going to have the cube. I mean, here, AWS, so I mean, let's talk about that for a second because I want to talk about the cloud and the real impact of the personnel issues. So DevOps is like a mindset, and it's also a category that I would call the warriors of cloud would put themselves into. Guys who eat class, these guys are like, they do engineering ops in one, they're like the Facebooks, they're the application guys who built their own or configured their own in cloud to do that, right? Correct. So that's a DevOps guy. But now DevOps has become kind of a cultural thing where it's kind of like, like a, a category. But it's hard to do. So in the IT enterprise, what does the DevOps personnel look like? What's the kind of role, what kind of, kind of, what kind of role are they doing? What is the, is it, is it a formula, is it a category? I think there's some guys on the, tend to be more on the architect side that are developing the next generation in IT. But still, back to your point on the, the DevOps in general, we definitely see the, the shadow IT going on where those guys are out in front, they're using their credit cards, getting around IT, and then they're actually bringing it back, giving it to IT in terms of now you got to run this. I think we just and saw our DevOps personnel, yeah. which is uh, looking for a like. job. Yeah. Yeah. They're crazy. <laughs> Strikes are crazy. <laughs> yeah. They eat class, and that's the thing about DevOps. But the thing is, is that most guys in the IT enterprise just aren't that good yet. I mean, there are some elite soldiers or, and warriors, IT athletes we call them, but it shouldn't be hard. It should be easy. So the DevOps is a mindset. So is that cloud ops? Because the IT is going to have an operation that has to have cloud. There's, there are on-premise data center software and solutions. We Got tend, a red so hat far, here, we, a tend to, here. we tend to see it's the architecture team together with 
what have been the virtualization themes that are now charting that architecture for cloud and trying to stay in front of those DevOps teams that are going out there and using whatever they can get their hands on. And something like our Amazon solution that we have actually allows them to bridge that together. And there's going to be more coming down that road where we're going to be able to bridge those two so communities. You, so Jim, you see the virtualization teams expanding that role? A lot of them, we see that kind of the predominant next step that they're taking. Yeah. They've heavily virtualized, they've laid on top uh, a lot of the orchestration, they've done disaster recovery. The next thing they're building on top of that is cloud. It's kind of a natural evolution. What was the impetus for the AWS partnership? Was that was that a particular customer, a set of customers? Was it was it NetApp Vision? Was it? I think it was a, a, a lot of different things going on at the same time. When we have been building that service provider program, it has been with those that are actually using off-the-shelf systems, NetApp, servers from somebody, networking from somebody, and then they provide their, their service on top. Their intellectual property is actually inside the, the service they build. That might be the, the software they drive on top of it, it might be the efficiency and they have a lower price. But when it came to what we call the hyperscale, the Amazons, the Azures, they're not doing that. Their, their intellectual property is a customized infrastructure. They are not buying NetApp, they're not buying HP, they're not, they're not buying off-the-shelf systems. And so that was an untouchable area for us. And so we have just been constantly working at how can we actually work something that's mutually beneficial to both companies. And we knew we weren't going to sell them. We weren't going to sell them an on-tap system. And so we ended up working together and coming together with what we felt was a very compelling solution. And it ends up having many of our customers starting to adopt cloud in their direction. And we have a lot of, as you know, we're, we're in the enterprise, we're in the data center, it helps them move that direction. Now you guys are everywhere. We just talked with Cynthia Sodder at CIO. We talked about shadow IT, and Dave and I have talked on theCUBE many times that shadow IT is not necessarily a bad thing. It creates competition for IT, but also right. it's an R&D playground. I don't need to get approval. I can just go, go do stuff right. under and the table. And when it pops out, you're a hero. It, it crashes, yeah, yeah. Right. run for cover, or Jesus. don't tell anyone. Just <laughs> bury it. I mean, so that's, a, again, a phenomenon, that's a cultural thing. But as more and more shadow IT becomes legitimized, and then the smart eyes and ears go look at the, the security policies, that's going to change, so it will become a practice. Do you think that, that that's going to evolve to a business practice? I, I definitely think so. How can you take, and instead of shunning that shadow IT, how can you let that innovation happen cheaply, fast. Turn it into a business practice. And then, how can you quickly turn that back into your standard IT? It's a market opportunity, you know. And we're trying to take advantage so of that. So Carl Eschenbach on theCUBE today asked about OpenStack, and I was kind of tired, and I, I, the way I said it kind of didn't come across great, and Carl, I apologize if, you, if you're watching. <laughs> I said, well, well VM, are you playing with OpenStack? He's like, playing with OpenStack? It's like, like a toy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, no, 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 I don't mean like playing. Like you're, you're working with it, you're contributing code. Um, but OpenStack is a market expansion opportunity for VM. That's a direct quote that he said, quoting Pat Gelsinger. Same with you guys with AWS and Shadow IT. This is a market expansion, right? Absolutely. And you know, OpenStack and open cloud technologies in general, we're a huge proponent. We're contributing code as well. We're contributing actual file services into the system. So everyone will be able to take advantage of that. And it's a, a big effort that we see. If we kind of break down the different kinds of service providers, we see the traditional service providers that do use like a, a NetApp and so forth, we see those that are moving toward OpenStack type opportunities, and then those like Amazon that are the, at the extreme end already. But so there's a fundamental assumption to that notion of OpenStack and Amazon, AWS, being a, being a, a, a market expansion opportunity for NetApp and, and VMware, for example. And that fundamental assumption is that that capability is going to increase the demand. Right? It's going to create new value. Uh, as opposed to, it's somewhat counterintuitive because people naturally think, oh, it's going to cannibalize. But you're betting, and I think you, you're right, it's like, it's like in the storage business, the sales guys don't want to do compression because they We're think they'll sell right. less storage. You so know? that's, and, so. And, and, but when they compress, what, do they, what happens? They sell more storage if you can reduce it. So it's, it's so I very like it very much. I liken it back to virtualization. Virtualization on the server side ended up selling fewer physical servers, and Wall Street, thought that that applied to storage and said, gee, well that, you know, storage, it's going to be miserable with virtualization. Untrue. And we told Wall Street that in roughly 2007, and the storage industry, NetApp included, benefited greatly from virtualization. I think exactly what you're bringing up, Dave, the same thing is going to happen with cloud. 
it is an opportunity for storage companies and we really want to be, we plan on dominating, we plan on being in front in that regard. Jim Stanks are here inside the Cube. Hey, thanks for sharing your cloud knowledge and perspective. Obviously, NetApp's doing a lot of great things. We know a lot about your OpenStack. We're gonna, we want to do more drill downs on the Cube in Palo Alto. Absolutely. Obviously, you guys are smoking. Got a good mojo going. NetApp has a spring in their step in the cloud. You guys are doing some great work. Congratulations, of course. Thanks for having us here live at AT&T Park, home of the San Francisco 49ers. I mean the Giants. Giants. <laughs> Not the Red Sox. They were here in town. I went to all three games. <laughs> um, they took two or three, um, my, my team. But special Q presentation. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We have one more guest and then wrap up here live on the outfield of AT&T Park. We'll be right back. Stay with us live at the NetApp customer party.